Okay. So we're going to finish up the APM part of this, and then Jeff is going to do, uh, probably during this hour, do the virtual infrastructure talk. Um, so just to start back at this, how do we, how do analytics, like this is an example of analytics that uh, we would use in APM. It's actually an example of one we're working on now. So again, just to reset, we've got the three different components in a simplified infrastructure, infrastructure the, the client, the browser, the, the app server, and the database. There are alarms, there's problems detected. These icons mean there's a problem. This is a bad problem, that might be a problem, and that's oranges in the middle. So these are parts of the infrastructure and there are alarms. So what we do is keep a relationship value. Uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. So base, this, these are causal links, and it's a system It's called Bayesian networking. So it's like a, your spam filter on your email, except that it, it's uh, applied to a network of infrastructure elements. So the way this system works is it looks at the time first, then uh, when the the time changes, we see this, this time went up, the, the, uh, this alarm is there, and the correlation is strong, so that one is a root cause. Then we follow, see that again. Time goes up, the values change, now it's more connected to the hypervisor, that hypervisor alarm is probably causing it too. And, and the system learns. So when there's an alarm that gets triggered, it will update the values based on was there a performance problem while that alarm happened and based on the response time. So the system constantly reevaluates itself and updates these uh, network connections. And if you remember from the, from the previous screens, the network is a very, the infrastructure of the network is very large uh, and it's a very powerful way to, uh, to understand the interactions from a system. So we track metrics on all the objects, and when those metrics do bad things, we correlate that all the way back to end user performance through this network, and when they are correlated, we add to these numbers. And that's, that's, the, basics, that's the basic understanding of machine learning. But this network becomes a problem you can solve. So the system has learned from the, the previous occurrences of these alarms. And now I can say, um, you know, the likelihood that this is involved is based on um, this number and then how it's connected. So I can multiply them and then I get, I get another value. So the time changes again. The alarms change. Now the, the database time is taking the most time. And I need to understand, is there a hypervisor alarm or a data, uh, data store alarm? In this case, there's two alarms on the data store. And, and the relationship numbers are pretty high. It's out of one. One would be the maximum. So the way, again, the, oops. the way the system works is starting with the strong understanding of the model that we have from the response time breakdown. Where is the time going? So we had uh, uh, three examples. This one, this one is kind of normal most of the times on the client. Uh, this one, the app server is now spiked. Lots of time on the app server. So that gives more weight towards that path. And then if the database has a lot of time, it gives more weight towards that path. But it's a combination of the time and the previously existing uh, Bayesian network that has been updating from activity on the system. So again, that's a really advanced area that we're working on and um, it should apply to some of the advanced courses in, in this university about machine learning. Um, it's, it's, it's reasonably basic for that, but 
what we're doing is applying that strong model that Jeff talked about and, and using machine learning to understand it automatically so the user doesn't have to decide. We'll tell the user which alarms are important. Uh, another application of machine learning that we're using is uh, we've got uh, the activity that a user takes through a website. So every, every user goes to a website, they do a number of actions before they leave. So we take the, the large set of millions of users uh, going through a website over time and analyze the list of uh, the sequence of pages that they went to and determine common patterns for pages. So here someone went, and actually um, this is based on an actual shopping website that's popular in Canada. I changed the name, but these patterns we actually got out. So people would go to that WEM and then they'd check their category and then this was a, something that happened a lot. They, the, and we found it from looking at the patterns of the website. So first step is to understand which pages are unique and the next is to understand what patterns or sequences of user interactions are common in that giant list of sequences of sessions. Any questions on that? It's getting late. Uh, we, saw, we saw this one, but um, what's interesting about this from an analytics perspective is understanding the seasonality in the data. Uh, what is seasonality? Um, um, periodicity. I think there's a translation there. Is it reasonable? So, so uh, understanding that the data fluctuates normally. But, um, you know, what, what kind of fluctuations can we have? Um, so I'll give an example. Um, day of the week. On Wednesdays, everyone has to submit their homework online. Uh, so Wednesdays, the site is busier. It's not so busy on Thursday because the deadline is Wednesday. Uh, can anyone think of another kind of routine period? So that's once a week. What other kinds of, can any, anyone? Like a busy hour, say, uh, when everyone gets into work in the morning, uh, the shopping website's traffic goes way up. That happens, it's true. Or when people take their lunch break, uh, the number of people at the restaurant go up. Uh, so the busy hour in the day, uh, any other kinds of, Anything? Yes? Uh, whenever it is uh, when it's online and the people are after school, after work, the, uh, the, the, uh, the throughputs will go high, go high. Right, so after school, after work, um, depending on the kind of site, maybe that's when everyone goes and uses it. 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Right, so, and then there's another kind which is, say, at a festival time, maybe a certain website is much busier right before a festival. So the, you've got, so to track this, you have to check for all kinds of um, periods. So you have to match the data to any, a large number of, of types of periods that you're checking for. So you can't just say, oh, is it hourly? You have to, what we do here for this set of analytics is compare the data to, I think it's uh, 958 different types of periods, uh, including every hour, uh, weekly, daily, um, and um, holidays and weekends. What's your weekend? In China, the weekends are uh, Sunday, Saturday and Sunday. In some countries, it's Friday and Saturday. So we have to track all those patterns against any metric uh, to see, to understand the baseline. So that's an example of analytics. The user doesn't have to say, this is an hourly busy time of eight o'clock. It, it finds it for them. And then so if there's a spike, it can tell you if it's normal or not. 
So this is the last major topic, uh, when things go wrong. Uh, when you have problems with your application, you need to understand uh, what caused the problem. And uh, so in APM, we categorize performance problems and errors differently. Uh, performance problems, slow response time, or timeout. You can't access the page. It's too slow. Has anyone ever been to a slow website? See whose arms work. Nobody's. Wow. Web, the internet is fast. We don't need APM here in China. Um, the, uh, everyone's been to a slow website. That's performance. An error, has anyone gone to a website and they click on the button and they get a, like a, a an error message or, yes, right? Everyone does that. It, it, or sometimes the whole page goes away and you get 404 or you get an exception. That's the worst, right? So, and then sometimes you get errors inside the code that just, you tried to order something and it said okay, but then you never got it. That's also an error. So that's the last one here. They just, it causes it to be abandoned but doesn't really have an impact. So, oh this isn't coming through on the screen. Um, there's, two, there's two kinds of uh, performance problems. Logical and physical. Uh, a logical problem is uh, something that is uh, that that is uh, not caused by a physical. So too much workload is a logical problem. That's too many students trying to register more than more than it was designed for, or the algorithm isn't right. The algorithm just doesn't handle. Um, can't sort a list of 10 million things. There's 10 million items, we need to sort it. The algorithm wasn't written well to do that. It's written as a bubble sort, and it takes five years. <coughs> uh, a physical problem is something like a slow disk. You're accessing a disk a reasonable amount of time, and, and, it's, slow, and it's slowing down, and now everything is slow. Internet latency, if you ever go to a website from another country, you'll notice that it's slower. Why? Well, because it takes a long time for the packets to get from here to Europe. Uh, and not enough CPU, so that would be, you just don't have enough CPU assigned in your virtual environment, and so the processing is slow. So th there's two sides, two kinds of problems. So, and this is, I put this in blue because this is important. The performance problems always have a physical or logical resolution. Doesn't matter which kind of problem it is. And um, errors may have only one or the other, because it depends on what's causing the error, but there's not always uh, both kinds of resolution. What does that mean? I just give everyone time to read it. The so, uh, here's an example, uh, a problem. Too much workload, that's a logical problem. So, of course, it has a logical resolution. You can reduce the workload. Hey, everybody, stop using the website. Uh, if it's causing a performance problem, that usually does it for you, people leave. But you can also tune the algorithm to handle the better workload. Same physical, same, same thing though, there's a physical resolution, just add more CPU. That's, that's a trick. It's a performance problem, and there's both kinds of resolutions. And uh, you can tell the bias of somebody. I've talked to uh, system administrators and performance tuners about problems they had, and I say, um, you know, well, I, I'd like to tune the application code. That's my bias. And he says, oh, we never do that. We only ever reconfigure the database because they're you know, database administrator. Or um, if they're hardware, they like to add more CPU. Doesn't matter that the algorithm is bad and you could not use all the CPU. They, they just, all they know how to do is add CPU and that's their bias. So you'll find based on the persona, the bias to solve the problem one way or another. But uh, it is possible to solve it either way. 
So, another question. It's getting late. Who can answer this one? Can you come up with a performance problem and a logical and physical resolution? Or maybe someone can come up with a performance problem and I will give you the logical and physical resolution. Or I will come up with a performance problem and ask somebody to come up with one of the resolutions. How about my SQL statement is running slow? Oh, go ahead. Uh, you're, uh, there's too much data in this that you can, you can hold. And uh, the logical resolution is uh, you can change the data structure. And the physical resolution is you can add a disk or a Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Exactly right. Great. So I'll just repeat it so everyone can hear. If there's too much data in the system that the data it can't be stored, it's slowing, it's slow down. You can change the data structure, um, uh, add compression and, and indexes, or you can uh, add more disks so that uh, it can be more easily accessed. Errors. Sometimes there's only one kind of resolution. Sometimes it's both, but with a performance problem, it's, it's different. With errors, you got a bad number format causing a SQL exception. That's just bad code. That's an error. There's no physical resolution for that, right? Can you think of one? Um, you got a disk drive failure, uh, and the application can't write to that disk. Um, you might challenge this, but there, there's only a physical resolution for that. So if, if you've got, um, let's see if I have one of these. How about an error? Anyone had an error in your program code? An error that maybe isn't part of your normal exception handling? An I.O. error maybe? Anyone, you can't connect? You get an error, can't connect to the server that I'm trying to download stuff from. Because my network cable is unplugged. It's got a physical resolution. All right. So, fix your physical failures first. This is what you do when you have a, a problem. So, you have to fix, if it's a physical failure, it has to be fixed first. Um, then, then you're looking for competition. Remember, we talked about competition earlier, and the, we want to see if someone else is causing your performance, your, your resource availability problem. And obviously, virtualization is getting bigger and bigger. Cloud systems, um, with cloud systems, it's hard to detect competition. That's a very interesting area of research. How could you tell if you're if your uh, Amazon isn't giving you all the, the CPU it promised. Um, then you have to compare to baseline. So are my costs in line with the baseline? Should, would I, am I expecting these application costs? Am I expecting this resource usage? Is this throughput okay? And that, that would, when you do that, that, sometimes it's, I said, out of control logical problem. That, what that means is, Let's say you've got an algorithm that works great up to 100 things, but there's an error in that pro code and it goes into an infinite loop at 101. Or you've got a recursive algorithm that doesn't check uh, for, for an end condition in certain cases, and it just runs forever. That, that's, that's a logical problem, and, uh, and it, can, it can run away. So you, you either you fix the errors or you... Then you have to decide if you're going to tune the application or increase the resources. And uh, in practice, um, actually, this is something we deal with in our own system in Foglight. Um, uh, you have to decide what's the cost of having a programmer tune the application and what's the cost of adding the resources. It's not as simple as you think because um, resources might be cheap. If you've architected your application to be scalable, if you're running in a cloud environment, you can actually decide up front 
it's going to cost $500 a month to add another server. I know exactly what that costs. I'm not going to bother tuning. So, you know, just kind of wrapping up, as, as applications move into that cloud, we won't have physical resolutions as often because uh, when you have a failure, the resolution is restart your server on a new instance. That's the only physical resolution you will have. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have to uh, emphasize logical analysis. Also, the theory is that cloud infrastructure is either more reliable or so unreliable that you have to account for it in your coding. It's depending on your attitude. So, can we think of a performance problem that has a physical resolution in a normal environment, uh, but in a virtual or cloud environment, you have no physical resolution? And this will lead into Jeff's uh, virtual infrastructure monitoring talk. So this is the last question for APM. So whoever answers it will win the, the contest. There is no contest. Jeff, do you remember? I think I put it in here. Nope. Yeah. Put you on the spot. Disk I.O. Disk I.O. usage. You're over your disk I.O. In a normal environment, you can add an extra router. In a cloud environment, you can't. Their, their disk I.O. is what they give you. It's, it's a service level. They say, we support this much throughput, and that's it. So you have to tune. You don't have the option anymore to upgrade your hardware. You don't own it. So that's the answer to that question. OK. So just to recap, we talked about applications, thinking about them as transactions and infrastructure. Again, transaction is the flow of information, and the infrastructure are the components that, that run the, that run the, uh, the program. Uh, we talked about why and how you do APM. What, what were the five major pieces that will be on the exam? I think you mentioned, no, there's no exam. It's OK. Uh, and then when things go wrong, how do you solve problems? How do you identify? So when you're in your labs and you're thinking about what you want to, what you're, what you're uh, producing in the exercises in the labs, think about the two topics I covered, metrics. How are my metrics structured? And then how do they help me do these things? If I'm, if I'm writing a metric, how would it help me solve a physical or logical problem? How would it help me make the decision? How would I later apply analytics to that data? Is my model structure, does it make sense uh, in this context? So Foglight is an open-ended system, and you can build whatever you want. But what should you build? You should build things that, that have a purpose like these. Otherwise, uh, you're just uh, churning metrics all the time. So um, that's it's. It will definitely impact the quality of your exercises if you think about these topics while you're, while you're doing them. OK. So just to recap, this is a, you know, you've seen it a lot, but you are, uh, you are ensuring availability and performance. And the final goal is to deliver business value. So just remember that as you are going through your labs at the end of the week. All right. Any questions on APM? And then I'm going to hand over to Jeff to give the final talk on virtual infrastructure monitoring. Or afterwards, you can come and talk to me directly. Thanks very much.